title of our sermon this morning is Don't Lose Heart. Don't Lose Heart. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We've been working our way verse by verse through Paul's second canonical letter, letter to the Corinthian church. And this morning, we want to remind ourselves that as Paul is writing this letter, as Paul is writing to the letter, this letter to the Corinthian church, he's writing in the midst of great adversity. Great adversity. The church is still immature. Paul writing to them in 1 Corinthians as to babes in Christ. Sin has plagued this church. And until Paul's repeated rebukes, the Corinthians have done little to faithfully deal with it. And now, to add insult to serious injury, so to speak, false teachers have infiltrated the church at Corinth. Leading away disciples after themselves, these savage wolves are undermining Paul in the process. A full-scale mutiny is now underway in Corinth, and the accusations are flying. Paul's physical presence is weak, they say. His letters are too harsh. His speech is contemptible. He was fickle, they say. Duplicitous. Can't make up his mind about his travel plans. He was mishandling the giving. Mishandling the offering, not handling appropriately the funds given by the church. He suffered too much to be blessed by God. Is suffering more an indication of God's abandonment of his ministry, not God's blessing on his ministry. And in addition to all this, there are many, many in Corinth who now reject the gospel and turn away from Paul and his apostolic message. Paul knows well... That if his apostolic authority is undermined in Corinth, then his apostolic message is also undermined in Corinth. If his message is undermined, then many in Corinth will suffer shipwreck of their faith and the church ultimately may be lost. Right? These circumstances have Paul reluctantly playing defense, so to speak. The stakes are high and Paul must enter into a defense of his Ministry, defending his apostolic credentials, defending the veracity of biblical truth that he's preaching, defending ultimately here the integrity of his ministry, as we've seen from chapter 2, verse 14, now through chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. All of this, right, all of this, the persecution, the difficulty, the adversity, the rejection, all of this can lead to distress or even discouragement in the strongest of God's servants. Right? Chapter 1, verse 8, Paul says, We were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. In chapter 2, verse 4, the circumstances in Corinth led Paul through much affliction, through anguish of heart in many tears. Chapter 2, verse 13, he had no rest in his spirit. In one place he describes himself as downcast. In another place, he has great sorrow and continual grief in his heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, he faces tribulations, needs, distresses, stripes, imprisonment, tumults, labors, sleeplessness. And through all this, Paul states now in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 1, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. Ain kakeo is the word, to become discouraged, to become disheartened. He says it again in chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, Paul says, we do not lose heart. This man has been through a lot, amen? And we've seen much of that as we've worked through this letter to the Corinthian church. This word, lose heart, rarely used by Paul in the New Testament. It carries a range of meaning based on its context. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, this word refers to growing weary of the work or disheartened in the work. Just succumbing to exhaustion, succumbing to being tired, growing weary, growing weary of facing the difficulty, facing the the adversity, growing weary of facing the persecution. Just refers to growing weary in the work. Paul says in the Galatians text, he says, let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season, Paul says, we shall reap if we do not, and here it is, lose heart. If we don't give up, if we don't give out, if we don't throw in the towel, we shall reap if we don't lose heart, Paul says. 
And this from a man who has suffered much. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, the word here communicates discouragement. Where Paul says there, I ask that you do not, here it is, lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is for your glory. And this is interesting, right? In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 13, Paul's letter to the Ephesians is called a prison epistle. Why is that? Because Paul wrote it while he was in prison. And Paul, in prison, is writing to those outside the prison, telling them not to give up or lose heart because of his imprisonment. <laughs> Paul's got the right attitude about gospel ministry, amen? Don't lose heart. And when the guy in prison isn't losing heart, and he's writing you to tell you outside of prison, don't lose heart, it's a little easier for us to take him at his word and not lose heart, Right? Don't lose heart, Paul says. We don't lose heart. As much as Paul has been through, Paul says, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. This bog, this slog of weariness and discouragement is described by John Bunyan in a number of ways on Christian's journey to the celestial city in Pilgrim's Progress. You remember that book? The miry slow of despond, said help. Is the descent whither the scum and filth that attends conviction of sin doth continually run. And therefore it is called the slow of despond. And about as fast as Christian begins his journey to the celestial city is almost as fast as he is caught in that slow and has to work himself out and get out of the mire. Later, the pilgrims being weary, they fall asleep near Doubting Castle. Right? The owner whereof was giant despair. And it was in his grounds that they were sleeping from their weariness when the giant, who was stronger than they were, takes them as his prisoner. Don't grow weary, Paul says. Do not become discouraged. Don't lose heart. And you'll succumb to the giant despair. The word lose heart. In keo, in kakeo, carries the sense of giving up in the face of difficulty, giving up in the face of trial. Rather than continuing the fight, rather than continuing the battle, you throw in the towel. It carries the sense of slowing down, even sitting down in your course, rather than pushing forward across the finish line, continuing the race despite difficulty. It means to succumb to doubts, to succumb to fears, to give in to apathy, to give in to lethargy, to give in to sluggardliness. There are professing Christians who have been in lethargy, apathy, or sluggardliness for years. They're in the slow of despond. It means to stop striving, to stop toiling, to stop laboring, to stop pressing forward. To lose heart, to lose heart implies that you need to have heart to begin with. Most professing Christians have no heart to begin with. No new heart, at least. They have no heart for His Word. No heart for prayer. No heart for lost sinners. No heart for evangelism. No heart for preaching the gospel. Most professing Christians today have no heart for His church. No heart for the people of God. No heart for holiness. One in pastor once said that Christians today suffer from the weariness of performancism. <laughs> That's about the most absurd thing I've ever heard. Most professing Christians today suffer from performancism. Do they get weary going to a one hour service on Sunday? <laughs> with Christians all over the place, with Christians all over the place, professing Christians Everywhere you look, when was the last time that you've been witness to? When's the last time that someone tried to share the gospel with you? When did you last run into other Christians? When you're out witnessing, when you're out preaching the gospel, when did you last run into other Christians from other churches out preaching the gospel, out sharing their faith, out open air preaching in the parks? No, most professing Christians need to lose their stony heart. They need to get a new heart of flesh in Christ. Gain for themselves a heart of flesh. Paul is speaking here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Paul is speaking here to those Christians in this Christ-hating world that are actually following him in Christian ministry. 
those Christians that are following Christ in Christian ministry, those that preach the gospel and make disciples, those that strive to obey His commands from the heart, those that choose to love their brothers and sisters in the church, to edify them, labor, to minister and to serve them, those that meditate on His Word day and night because His Word is their delight, those that hate their sin and daily or even hourly repent, those for whom the battle against sin may become wearisome at times, right? Those for whom the preaching of the gospel may become discouraging when there are few who turn to Christ. Those for whom loving someone in Christ may have turned into losing them from Christ. Those who press forward and serve the Lord, even when the pressures of this world rise up and attempt to choke out the seed that was planted in your heart. Paul says to you, do not lose heart. You know, it's unfortunate in our day and age that we have to make distinctions like that. Right? But this word of Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, do not lose heart. Don't lose heart. Or for those who have a heart for Christ, a heart for the Lord, a heart for His cause, a heart for His message. It's for Christians who are following the Lord. We have to make that distinction in our day when so many professing Christians don't follow the Lord. Paul's message here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, is not to soothe you who are not following him. His message is not to soothe you who put forth no effort for his cause, no effort for his name. So please make no mistake, Paul's message is here for those who are tempted to fall back from serving him. Tempted to sorrow and discouragement in the ministry because they're laboring in the ministry and the ministry is not easy. Ministry is hard work. They're toiling and they're laboring for the cause of Christ. They're battling their sin. Right? Those are those for whom Paul here preaches this word of encouragement. Don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. He then, Paul gives us three motivations to sustain us in Christian ministry. Three motivations to sustain us in Christian ministry. One, God's mercy. Two, God's mission. Three, God's message. We have God's mercy. We have God's mission. We have God's message. First, don't lose heart because we have received God's mercy. Verses 1 and 2. Look there with me. Don't lose heart. We have received God's mercy. Look at verse 1. Therefore, Paul says... Since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And whenever you see a therefore, whenever you see a therefore, you've got to go back and look and see what it's there for. Okay? So with a therefore at the beginning of verse 1, Paul refers to his description of the Christian ministry that really began back in chapter 2, verse 14. But he's referring to his description of the Christian ministry that really began back in chapter 2, verse 14, where Paul says, Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. No matter how difficult, no matter the adversity you face, no matter the persecution, no matter the rejection, though it may seem that many turn away, thanks be to God who always, always leads us in triumph in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 3, you are an epistle, Paul says, of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of a living God. Verse 7, if the ministry of death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious. Verse 8, how will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? Verse 9, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glorious, in glory. Chapter 3, verse 12, therefore, since we have such a glorious hope, since we have such a glorious ministry, new covenant ministry, Paul says we use great boldness of speech. We don't shrink back. Chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, therefore, since we have this ministry, this new covenant ministry, this ministry of the Spirit, this ministry of life, this ministry written on tablets of heart, tablets of flesh, as we have received mercy, Paul says, we do not lose heart. We don't lose heart. We have a glorious ministry, amen? A glorious message, a glorious hope, a glorious gospel, a glorious Savior. We've been delivered to this ministry. And having been given this ministry, as we have received mercy, Paul says we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. But Paul, here in verse 1, referring to himself and his co-laborers in the gospel, he says we have this glorious ministry of hope. 
glorious ministry, hope in Christ, right? Hope in the gospel, hope in the promises. Remember with me, what was the, what was the key that unlocked the door of doubting castle and freed Christian from diet, giant despair? What was the key? It's the key of promise. The promises, believing in the promises, hoping in the promises, right? Since we have this glorious ministry, this ministry of hope, this ministry of righteousness, this ministry of the Spirit, this ministry of life, this ministry of glory, since we have this ministry, we do not lose hope. Paul goes on to say here that we have this ministry through God's mercy. It's a mercy to us to be given this ministry. We have this ministry, Paul says, verse 1 there, Literally, it says, as we have been mercied by God, as we have been mercied by God, the grammar here, verse one speaks of God's mercy having come to Paul one time in the past, right? One time in the past with continuing effects or continuing implications into the present. That one moment in the past refers to Paul's conversion, right? His glorious Encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, where the Lord saved him, showing him great mercy. Think about the mercy shown to Paul. Right? Paul is on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, to persecute the Lord's church, to drag them back to prison in Jerusalem, to see them put to death. Paul is on his way to Damascus to do this when God shows him great, great mercy. Literally, he was mercied by God. Mercied by God. Paul considered it a tremendous mercy that God saved him that day. Right? An unspeakable mercy, an indescribable mercy. And he also considered it a tremendous mercy at the same time that God called him into gospel ministry for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, who just saved him. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And Paul describes this here in his pastoral epistle to Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Several times in Acts, the New Testament, where Paul recounts his conversion on the road to Damascus and what a glorious mercy it was and here in this little letter to Timothy Paul begins in chapter 1 verse 12 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12 Paul says I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. You, all, you can almost hear Paul, right, emphasizing me, right, in his glorying in the Lord's mercy. I thank Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has enabled me. Because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent man... But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. Paul was an enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ. An abject enemy of the Lord. Paul was an enemy of the church. He loathed the Lord Jesus Christ and he abhorred the Lord's fledgling church. God, from his perspective, if you think about it, God didn't need Paul. God didn't need Paul's talents. God didn't need Paul's mind. God didn't need Paul's efforts. God didn't need Paul any more than he needs any of us, right? But simply to magnify the greatness of his mercy, God saves, gloriously saves the Apostle Paul. Look at verse 14. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying. Worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I don't believe that's hyperbole on Paul's part. Paul believes himself to be the chief of sinners. He persecuted the church of God. He sat there and gave approval while they stoned Stephen. You don't think that Paul was convicted over his sin? That Paul was convicted over, he, over how he blasphemed God and persecuted the church of the Lord Jesus Christ? Paul was amazed at the mercy of God shown to him. Amazed. Verse 16, however, for this reason, for this reason I obtained mercy, 
so that in me first, Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul saying essentially in verse 16, listen, if he'll save me, he'll save anybody. If his mercy can extend to me, his mercy can extend to you. How many of you here in Christ would say amen to that? To anyone sitting here this morning, if you're not in Christ Jesus through repentant faith, listen to me. If he'll save me, Lord have mercy, he'll save you too. Right? If his grace will extend to me, his grace will extend to you. If you'll simply cry out to him, trust him, put your faith in him, and trust yourself to him. The Lord is gracious and abounding in mercy, rich in mercy to all those who call upon him in faith. He worships in verse 17. Now, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul counted it a privilege. Paul counted it a grace. A mercy to be placed into the ministry. Are you here this morning? Do you count it to be a begrudging duty? Do you think of, of serving Christ with the gospel as something you want to make excuses to get out of? Something you neglect because you just don't want to do it? I'm afraid that you don't have the same view of the Lord's mercy here that Paul does. Paul counted it a privilege. Paul saw it as a grace. Tremendous mercy that the Lord would even save him and then show him grace and mercy to put him into the ministry. Instead of judging Paul, instead of condemning him and executing him there on the spot, right? Instead of judging him as a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, God showed him mercy by putting him into the ministry to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the King. It's the same for you and I. It's the same for you and I. We are shown great mercy in being saved to serve. We're shown great mercy. In the face of such mercy, in the face of such mercy, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. Jonathan Edwards said this. Christian, consider the freeness and wonderfulness of the grace of God towards yourself. You had such a wicked heart. You lived such a wicked life. And it would have been most just with God to have you cast off forever. But he has had mercy upon you. He has made his glorious grace appear in your eternal salvation. You had no love to God, but yet he has exercised unspeakable love to you. You have despised God and set light by him. But so great a value has God's grace set on you and your happiness that you have been redeemed at the price of the blood of his own son. You chose to be with Satan in his service, but yet God has made you a joint heir with Christ of his glory. You were ungrateful for past mercies, yet God not only continued those mercies, but bestowed unspeakably greater mercies upon you. Praise the Lord. You were first refused to hear God when called, yet God heard you when you called. You abuse the infinite, infiniteness of God's mercy to encourage yourself in sin against him. Yet God has manifested the infiniteness of that mercy and the exercise of it toward you. You have rejected Christ and set him at nothing. And yet he has become your savior. Glorious mercy. Thomas Watson. So, therefore... You who have been monuments of God's mercy should therefore be trumpets of his praise. You who have tasted that the Lord is gracious, tell others what experiences you have had of God's mercy, that you may encourage them to seek to him for mercy. I will tell you what God has done for my soul. There are many, there are many who shrink back 
They shrink back. They lose heart because they've never felt the weight of their sin. They shrink back when the going gets tough. They shrink back at the fear of man. They shrink back with trifling temptations of sin. They shrink back because they've never felt the weight of their sin. Having never felt truly the weight of their sin, they don't know the genuine bliss of divine mercy. The genuine bliss of divine forgiveness. You know this hymn. And sing it with me. My sin, oh the bliss of that glorious thought. Sing it with me. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. That's mercy, right? That's mercy. The mercy of God in Christ. Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Having this glorious ministry, having been mercied by God in this way, so to speak, we do not lose heart. We do not lose heart. Brother, sister, we can't lose heart. Press forward. Press on. Persevere. Rather than losing heart, rather than shrinking back or neglecting our duty, sitting down on the job, so to speak, quitting the race, as a result of this God-given mercy, Paul says in verse 2, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Rather than losing heart, we do not walk in craftiness nor handling the Word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. First, as we have received such mercy from God, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Think with me. We've put off our former conduct. If you're in Christ, you've put off the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And you are putting off that old man day by day. right? You've put off the hidden life of shame and guilt that characterized you as an unbeliever. Those things that you did in darkness. Shameful things are done in darkness to hide the shame of them. That's why they're called hidden things of shame. And things not just done in darkness, but things thought in secret. Things imagined in the mind. Desires or feelings that do not accord with righteousness. Secret thoughts. Secret heart sins. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 8. Paul says, for you were once darkness. Once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. Finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. Have no fellowship, Paul says, with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. But all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light. For whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Paul Paul renounced the hidden things of shame. Shame is that disgraceful conduct that rightfully produces embarrassment or humiliation. How many of you felt shame before? Right? Today, many, in a twisted way of dealing with the shame of their actions, to deal with the shame, they flaunt those things which are shameful. Right? They flaunt those things which are shameful in order to deal with their own feelings of shame. Shame that they should rightly feel for their actions. They now flaunt in order to offload the shame, so to speak. Then, rather than acknowledging the shamefulness of them, they blame others for shaming them. Right? They're shaming me. 
And one of the chief examples, we see this now on a regular basis, when you walk around in the attire of a harlot, and then you blame others for body shaming you. What kind of worldly nonsense is that? You deserve the shame that you feel for walking around half-dressed. Modesty, right? Modesty. Shameful, disgraceful conduct that they rightfully hide because of the shame and humiliation of it. Paul has renounced the hidden things of shame. Christian brother, Christian sister, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. We're to have no part with them any longer. If you're here today and you're outside of Christ, turn. Turn from your hidden life of shame. Gain a sense through God's grace of the mercy associated with the forgiveness of your sin, right? Offloading the weight of your sin, the weight of that shame, the weight of that disgrace. Lord Jesus Christ will forgive you if you'll turn to Him in faith. Second, through God's mercy, verse 2, we do not walk in craftiness, Paul says. We do not walk in craftiness. We aren't deceitful and we aren't deceiving. We don't walk in trickery or cunning. We don't use devices of men to gain our own agenda or to achieve our own ends, to seek our own gain, to make our own profit, right? Paul said that the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Those who walk in craftiness walk like the serpent. They're out trying to deceive for their own gain, their own personal agenda, to achieve their own ends. They are crafty. They're unscrupulous. Ultimately, they're uncaring, unloving. They're manipulative, trying to pack the pews for their denominational statistics. All right, we're talking about inside the church, not just outside, right? Inside the professing church, these things go on every day. Willing to do almost anything to get what they want. There's a church in town, quote-unquote church. It's called Action Church. Action Church put out a postcard with a Ferris wheel, a sort of a carnival atmosphere in the background, put out a video to match. And basically their slogan is, we want to make it difficult to go to hell by making it fun to go to church. And what they're selling is a carnival atmosphere in the church. Now listen, someone might, and do, they do, take offense when we mention a specific church or a specific impastor. Well, listen, the reason that we do that, if they're going to put out public demonstrations of this, deceiving many, then they are worthy of public rebuke. That is a false church. That guy is a false teacher. Stay away from that false nonsense. They are out deceiving, trying to gain disciples to themselves by cunning, by trickery, by falsehood, by deceit. Like the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, Someone might come along and try to deceive. It's fun following Christ. Don't worry about your sin. Don't worry about your sin. Peace, peace. When there is no peace to the wicked, says my God. They're crafty. They're unscrupulous. Finally, as we have received mercy, Paul said in verse 2, we do not handle the word of God deceitfully. We don't handle the word of God in deceit. We don't adulterate the Word of God. We don't falsify it or corrupt it or pervert it. We don't water it down. We don't misrepresent it. We've got to cut it straight, the Bible says. We don't hide the truth in order to deceive you or to lure you in with the lie. What does that do when you package church as a carnival? That's hiding the truth, so to speak. Covering it up to deceive you, to lure you in with the lie, right? Lure you in with entertainment. The word, this word for deceitfully, adulterating, at the end of verse 2, came to be used for mixing gold or mixing silver, a valuable metal, mixing them with inferior metals to degrade it or to make it cheap, to make it inexpensive. In order to raggle a profit, right, out of it. To deceive someone, to make money at their expense for profit. The deceit comes in that. The deceit comes from hiding the cheap substitute in the mixture with actual gold or actual silver. Truth, as it were, mixed with lies. A little bit of truth. 
mixed with lies. A little bit of lies covering up the truth, right? Sometimes not as much as what is said, as much as it is what is not said that deceives. Mixing lies with the truth. Mixing deceit with the valuable, right? With that which is the treasure. You know, we've looked at this little conjunction, but, that begins verse 2, the Greek word Allah, at the beginning of verse 2. And so far in looking at this verse, we've interpreted its use in relation to what comes immediately before it. We do not lose heart. Rather, Allah, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. But listen, it's also very likely here that Paul has the false teachers in mind when he describes his ministry here and uses that contrasting conjunction, but at the beginning of verse 2, that it's meant to be used in direct contrast to those wicked men, those false apostles, false teachers that have risen up in Corinth. But, Paul says then, if we take it to be that, but, verse 2, in contrast to those false teachers in Corinth, we have renounced the hidden things of shame. Unlike those wicked deceivers, we don't walk in craftiness. Unlike those peddling the word of God for profit, we don't handle the word of God deceitfully, right? That's not only in stark contrast with the false teachers in Corinth that opposed Paul and sought to siphon off disciples after their adulterated message, it's also indicative of false teachers in our day. It's also indicative of false teachers in our day. Unlike so many today that peddle the word of God, we say with Paul, we have not adulterated the word of God. We don't walk in craftiness. We're not handling or peddling the word of God in falsehood. What's shameful to false teachers today is actually the message of the cross. The thing that is shameful, actually shameful, to false teachers in our day is the message of the cross. It's the reason that false churches, false teachers have to repackage the message to this world. They know that this world finds it offensive. Right? That's clear. This world finds it offensive, and so what do they do to appeal to the world? Or to sell it, quote-unquote, to the world? To package it to the world? They repackage the message. Come and look at our entertainment. Come and look at our music. Come and look at our church. Come and look at our kids' programs. Come get our coffee in the lobby. Right? Come look at our fellowship. Come look at our kids' days. Come look at our events. They repack. They find the message of the cross to be foolishness or they find the message of the cross to be shameful and so they package the message in a different way to appeal to the world. It's really clear, isn't it? You can tell those churches who find the message of the cross to be foolishness by the way that they package what they're selling. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. You want to know if they see it as foolish? You want to know if they see it as shameful? Then look at how they package their product. Right? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 18. Here Paul says again to the Corinthian church, right? Verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. This world is not clamoring for the message of forgiveness of sins. In Christ, this world is not clamoring to hear God's word. This world loves its sin. Lost people love their sin. They're content in their sin until the Lord opens their eyes, right? And their content becomes a blissful discontent. Right? They want their sin. They want the wickedness of this world. So, verse 18, the message, therefore, of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, their minds are blinded. Their minds are blinded. They don't see it. They can't see it. But, Paul says, chapter 1, verse 18, to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. What? The message of the cross. For it is written, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Do you think you're wise? 
and you want to repackage church, so to speak? You think you're wise and want to repackage the gospel? Listen, let's take out its offense. We can do it. We can preach it better than Jesus did. They crucified Jesus. We can preach it better. (laughs) It's fun to come to church. Another church I just saw rewrote the lyrics to songs sung in a hit movie here recently, a musical. Rewrote the lyrics to fit, quote unquote, the gospel. And they sang those songs in their church. Again, you can tell what they see as shameful or what they believe to be shameful by how they repackage their product to sell it, to market it, right? They find the message of the cross foolishness. They find the message of the Bible, the message of the Son of God crucified for sinners, they find that to be shameful. So they'll package it with worldly trinkets in order to sell it. God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Verse 20, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? That is simply foolishness, right? The message of the cross is the power unto salvation. For since, verse 21, in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. The Jews request a sign. The Greeks seek after wisdom. But we, but, see the contrast? But we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You want to know if they see it as shameful. You want to know if they see it as foolish. Then look at how they package their product. They chum the water, so to speak, with bait. Right? They chum the water with bait, seeking to entice this world to a Christianity, quote-unquote, that involves something other than Christ. To a Christianity that's not Christian. Obscuring, with all of their foolish nonsense, obscuring what they believe to be the shameful message of the cross. The message of the cross isn't enough for them. The message of the cross isn't what they want to preach. It's shameful to the lost, and so they cover their shame. And they cover their shame with music. They cover their shame with entertainment. They cover their shame with light sermons that last 20 minutes and never confront you in your sin. Right? They cover the shame of the cross with encouraging messages. Comforting you in your sin. Preaching peace, peace when there is no peace to the wicked. Word peddlers, as Paul says, they hide as a good marketer, as a good salesman might do, as a slick salesman, a snake oil salesman might do. They hide the perceived deficiencies of their product to their consumer. Who is their consumer? The world. They overly emphasize those benefits that most appeal to the consumer, right? As a slick salesman might do. Look at these benefits. Don't look at this over here. Look at these benefits. They tell them what they want to hear. They look for features that will get their attention. They're trying to appeal to the world. This is worldless nonsense. Worldly foolishness. Appealing only to those who are perishing. Paul says, brother, sister, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. This is going on all around us, all around us. Don't lose heart. God is in control. And God has said that it is the message of the cross that saves. It is the power of God unto salvation. Don't lose heart. Verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, don't you? That not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. 
and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That, as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. Let him glory in the Lord. You know, this church is not our selling point. As wonderful as this church is, right? As much as I love this church, this church is not our selling. We're not selling our church. We're not marketing our church. It's not simply we're trying to get people to come to our church. That's not at all what this is about, right? Come to our church because the Lord has preached here. Come to our church because salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone is preached here. And you, if you're not in Christ, you need him. Your soul depends upon it. Come here for the preaching of that message. Right? Come here for the preaching of the cross. Our selling point is not the music. Our selling point, quote unquote, is not the kids programs. It's not the fellowship. It's not the coffee. <laughs> Our selling point is not to soothe you in your sin. Come here week after week so that you can feel better about yourself while you stay in your sin. Our selling point, quote unquote, is that God the Son was crucified for sinners and He now reigns as Lord over all, Lord over you. You need that. I need that. And praise God, He offers it to us freely. He offers it to us freely. That's to be our point of contact, so to speak, with unbelievers. They're dead in their sins, and they need Christ. If you're here this morning, that's what you need. You need to feel, come to understand, come to see the weight of your sin. It's the very bad news, the very terrifying news that must precede the glorious news of grace and mercy in Christ Jesus our Lord. You need that. You and I on this side of eternity will battle sin, battle temptation until God calls us home. We need constant exhortation. Paul says, remind them of these things constantly, that they should be careful to maintain good works. How often? Constantly. How often do we need it? We need it constantly, don't we? You're fooling yourself if you say you don't. Unlike the false teachers, right? In great contrast to the false teachers, Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at chapter 2, flip the page, verses 1 through 5. So unlike the false teachers, Paul says this, beginning in verse 1. I, brethren, he said, when I came to you, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. They did. Those false teachers came. Boasting in the excellence of their speech, right? Those false teachers came boasting in their credentials, boasting in how eloquent they were, right? Boasting in their backgrounds, boasting in their teachers, right? Boasting in their message, boasting in all they had to offer, boasting in their letters of commendation, right? Boasting, boasting, boasting. And Paul says, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellence of speech, I didn't come with wisdom. They boasted in their wisdom, boasted in their teaching, boasted that they had their act all together. And Paul says, I didn't come that way with excellence of speech or wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. How did Paul come? Verse 2. I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. What a contradiction, right? What a distinction. Paul determined not to know anything among them except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
These guys boasted in their wisdom, and here's Paul, Christ and him crucified. Christ and him crucified. The message of the cross. Verse 3, I was with you in weakness. They said his weakness was contemptible. His speech rude. I was with you in fear, Paul says. They boasted in their confidence. Paul said, I was with you in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. That's all they had were persuasive words of human wisdom. But, Paul says, verse 4, in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why, Paul? Verse 5. So that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Amen. I think with me for a moment. They came boasting in their speech, the excellence of their speech. We got guys today who will quaff their hair, slap on some skinny jeans, put on a wire rim pair of glasses, and boast themselves as being a great, eloquent speaker, right? I can't wear skinny jeans. As soon as I put skinny jeans on, they turn into fat jeans. <laughs> You're not going to get eloquence of speech, right? They boast in that. Great public speakers, eloquent speakers. They buy their sermons, have someone craft them in just the right way. I remember one time after listening to a miserable sermon, I was in a bookstore, looking in the bookstore in the, the area of the store for church supplies, and I see a box on the top shelf, and I... Look at the, 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 the label on the box, and it was the sermon I had just heard. He had preached a sermon out of a box from a quote-unquote Christian bookstore, right? They're boasting in their activities, boasting in their music, right? Change the lyrics to a musical song, you know. Put one of their paid musicians, singers, on stage to sing it in a dress just like the person on the movie, put all the lighting, the piano, just like the person on the movie, and then sing the song, right? Boasting in their entertainment, boasting in their kids' programs. Paul says, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul essentially says, listen, we say with Paul, if we had all those things, if we prioritized all those things, if we emphasized all those things, if we sold, quote unquote, sold you all those things, our concern would be that your faith would not be resting on the power of God but in those things. Your faith would not be resting on the power of God, but on the wisdom of men. If we manipulated the message, watered it down, recrafted it to make it appealing to you, how would then we know for certain that your faith isn't resting on the wisdom of our manipulation, the wisdom of our crafting, and not on the power of God? When those come along, those men who come along and say, listen, we're, we're just going to, we're going to change the methodology a little bit. We're just going to tweak it. Instead of turn from your sin and trust Christ, we're just going to, we're just going to say it a little differently. It's not, it's just a matter of semantics. Just admit that you're a sinner, believe in Jesus Christ, and you can be saved. Where's Repentance. Listen, all you need to do is whisper this little prayer. This little prayer will change your eternity. Where is that prayer in the Bible? I was asked last week, why don't you do altar calls? Where are altar calls in the Bible? Listen, let's just change our methodology. If we can get man to move his will, if we can manipulate his will with 14 verses of I surrender all, 
and get him to walk. Listen, one more verse. You only have one more opportunity as if the Spirit of God is going to stop working because we're going to stop singing, I surrender all. Come on down. It's the last chance you've got. If I can just manipulate men's actions, manipulate men's minds. I knew a guy one time, we were out witnessing and I was talking to this guy and he said, listen, if you can give me five minutes with a person, I can get you a convert for Christ. What a godless piece of trite that is. He's manipulating. He's coercing. He's working on someone's will. He's packaging a product that he's selling and it's not what the Bible says. If you change the message, if you adulterate it in any way, if you corrupt it in any way, if you pervert it in any way, if you change it, alter it in any way, how is it that you know that their faith rests not on your wisdom but on the power of God? You don't know. Use the words that God uses. Use the words that the Bible uses. Use the methodology that the Bible uses. Do what God tells you to do and preach the gospel. And then trust God for the results. Stop this nonsense of trying to woo the world hat in hand with your worldly and ultimately godless wisdom. Paul says, I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is such a damning indictment of most efforts today to reach the lost, isn't it? Paul says back in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, we've renounced all of this. We've renounced all of this. We've renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but what does Paul say? By manifestation of the truth, by a clear proclamation of truth, Right By an undiluted proclamation, an undiluted preaching, an undiluted presentation of the truth, commending ourselves in that way to every man's conscience in the sight of God who sees all things. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's as a result of God's mercy, right? It is... A tremendous grace of God, a tremendous mercy of God that you, brother, you, sister, have heard the truth. You came to see the exceeding sinfulness of your own sin. You came to see the preciousness, the treasure that is the Lord Jesus Christ. You turned from sin, turned from serving idols, right, worshiping idols, to serve the true and living God, to embrace Christ as your treasure, and now you live for Him as Lord. What a tremendous grace, right? What tremendous mercy. Then don't lose heart. It's God's mercy that saves sinners. God's grace that works in the heart of sinners. It's God's message that is the wisdom and power of God unto salvation. It's God's ministry, God's mission that we're involved in. Don't lose heart. We have received such glorious and infinite mercy. Trumpet His praises, right? Trumpet His praises. Trumpet His salvation. Proclaim Him as a trophy of His grace. And see Him glorified. Say with Paul, right? You're determined to know nothing among the lost except for Christ and Him crucified. Drop all the cunning craftiness of this godless world in the quote-unquote professing church of our day and just preach the Lord Jesus Christ and then trust Him for the results. Don't lose heart. Don't shrink back. Don't get discouraged. Paul's not discouraged. Paul's in prison when he's writing from the, to the, the folks in Ephesus telling them not to be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Don't shrink back. Don't give in to lethargy. Don't give in to apathy. Keep pressing forward. We have a glorious ministry and life is short. Right? We have been given such great mercy and we don't have many years on this earth to preach it. Right? Be steadfast. Be immovable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord. Knowing, knowing that every bit of that work that you do, not a lick of it is vain in the Lord. It is all 
according to his will. And he works all things together for good for you. And his word preached never returns void. All praise, honor, and glory to him who has given us this glorious ministry. Amen. Thank you.